on essay, so it's kind of a miniature version of what will eventually exist. From Destroyed Room, which you're looking at, through more recent works like Overpass and Dawn, visibility and invisibility have been the dominant concerns of Jeff Wall's art. Because he is a photographer, the first might seem a given. Within Wall's aesthetic universe, however, visibility is not the simple consequence of inclusion within the frame of an image. This medium is a light box, and a light box can be turned on or off. When the light box is on, the illumination provided by a cluster of fluorescent tubes irradiates a transparency behind which they are located. This transparency then becomes visible as an image, but invisible at the level of its material base. At the moment when the light box is turned off, the transparency is manifestly a transparency. Now, however, it no longer gives rise to an intelligible image. And this is not the end of the light box story. If the viewer remains standing for a few moments in front of the unlit transparency, she eventually acquires the capacity to make out a few of its details. The categories of visibility and invisibility then cease to be mutually exclusive and join together to form an inexhaustibly rich chiaroscuro. Evident by now, these categories are not ones to which Wall attaches any fixed meaning. There are significant shifts over time as to both their relationship to each other and the artist's own understanding of his medium. And I guess since Nicholas mentioned that um, some people know the artists they're talking about and others don't, I should say that I was colleagues with Jeff Wall at Simon Fraser um, in Vancouver many years ago when he, just before he became uh, a very famous artist. And, but I had no interest in his work at that moment in time. That, came later, and it was actually the um, Invisible Man piece that made me think again about the work and go back to it. And um, when I was asked to write an essay a few years ago for um, a retrospective in Vienna, and I knew I wanted to write about this, it had just been shut at the Marian Goodman Gallery, but it had been taken down, it was no longer lit, and it was in a back room, and um, she's the gallerist of many, um, of Coleman, of of many artists. Um, and at, at any rate, I was allowed because she wasn't there. She's kind of a you know, difficult person. Um, because, because she wasn't there, I was allowed to sit in the back and turn the light box on and off. And so then I saw what a light box looks like when the lights are off. And um, so for two days, I just kind of came and went and looked again and again at it. And, and then I decided to look at all the work. Um, I'm going to be talking about today. As several of Wall's other commentators have already noted, the goal towards which he worked in his early civichromes was total visibility. He chose the light box as the medium for arriving at this goal because it illuminates everything equally. Already in 1979, Wall attributed widely divergent effects to this fluorescent system. Since it, quote, eliminate shadows and their dramatic baroque imbalances and axialities, I'm quoting Wall, traditionally so rich in implications and meanings from a theological aesthetic of nature and a metaphysics of light, close quote, it redefines what we mean by the word image. It also poses a powerful challenge to what Nietzsche calls the two-world theory, rendering seeing an emphatically terrestrial activity. But this aesthetic and philosophical revolution does not necessarily translate into new values. It more often leads to commodity fetishism, social regulation, and the disenchantment of the world. As Wall continually reminds us, the light box derives from the institutions which most determine both what we buy and how we view ourselves and others, television, advertising, and cinema because it renders every part of what it shows equivalent and therefore quantifiable, and because it uses the same kind of illumination now found in most public places 
It also has a depreciating effect upon what it displays. Everything becomes the same. Finally, and most importantly in the present context, the light box is often used to expose people and things, i.e. to reveal their discreditable sides. It is deployed in this capacity by prisons, hospitals, factories, banks, the government, and all of the many branches of the security industry. Although its notion of what is discreditable differs sharply from the institutions I have just enumerated, much of the theoretical and aesthetic practice of the past 30 years has also been driven by the desire to expose dirty secrets. In the 1970s and early 1980s, Wall still kept a foot in this episteme. He therefore not only chose to work with, quote, the medium today which provides the most basic or at least the most pervasive conditions for visibility, close quote, but he also used it to display what is usually concealed. What Wall sought to display in his early civicrons was first and foremost the light box itself. By removing it from its usual venues, the street, the mall, the airport, and the home, and hanging it on the wall of a museum, he made it visible as an object in his own right, in its own right. In Picture for Women, which is on the screen now, a work from the same period, Wall engaged in a similar procedure at the level of the image. He revealed the agency responsible for the Sibichrome's transparency by shooting it in a mirror, reflecting himself, his camera, his studio, a number of light bulbs, and of course a woman to whom I will return later. In works like Stereo, um, a woman and her doctor, and Destroyed Room, Wall focuses more on the ideological than the technical aspects of the light box. In the first of these images, he draws attention to the role this object plays within commodification and the construction of gender through a proliferation of female goods, shoes, clothing, jewelry, and bric-a-brac. He also drags a skeleton of domestic violence, a violence which is so often precipitated by the inability of the female subject to approximate the ideal image held up to her by advertising and television out of the closet of heterosexual relationality. In A Woman and Her Doctor, he shows us what a woman would look like if she were to succeed in becoming a Revlon girl, as well as the arrows and power relations at the heart of what we generally call medicine. And in Stereo, he dramatizes the distance separating the male sexual organ from the phallus by situating a limp version of himself in the place reserved by Manet for Olympia, an American society for the consumption, for the male consumption of music and television. <clears throat> in Mimic and Milk, Wall also shows us how charged with meaning human posture and gesture can be. What speaks through the body is once again social rather than individual. By focusing on what is small and meager, Wall wrote in the 1979 essay, he hoped to, quote, lift the veil a little on the objective misery of society and the catastrophic operation of its law of value, close quote. He refers to what lies hidden behind the veil as the social unconscious and characterizes its eruptions as automatic and mechanical. The social unconscious consists of the hidden laws which work to establish and sustain the values of capitalism and the Enlightenment. Although the project I have just described is informed in a general sense by the period in which it was made, it is particularly indebted to film studies. Wall's early civicrones, like the work of writers like Christian Metz, Stephen Heath, and the theorists of Suture, is predicated upon the assumption that 